Hello YouTube, welcome back. This is episode 3 of recreating the Sutton Hoo Axe Hammer. So in this episode we are going to profile the head a little and we are going to fit the handle. We are also going to be replacing the swivel that I made in the first episode because I wasn't particularly happy with it. So here is the axe head and here is the handle so far. So the axe head needs a little profiling, the cheeks need defining a little bit more so I need to move that material in. I also want to push out this curve a little uh, because it's more curvy than in the drawing of the original. On the other side I potentially need to shorten the hammer itself though that might not happen today. Now as you can see here it is quite interesting uh, because the axe is flat sided uh, almost like a side axe that a carpenter would use so we are going to reproduce this on the axe. However, to start with, I'm going to use the drift as a handle, uh, like in the last episode. And after a quick scrub, we will start spreading out the material to fill that curve. So I am using the cross peen for this, uh, because it's the best way to spread material without it stretching lengthways. And again, I am being quite careful to keep it flat on its left side. So once you have cross beamed it to the extent that you are happy with, I will then take the flat of the hammer and I will carefully remove any cross peening marks. So to profile it, I'm just going to have it on off the anvil and just with the heel of the hammer I'm going to define the extent of those cheeks. I'm being quite careful here because I don't want to end up with a flat and as I'm profiling it I can also just carefully rotate the axe head upwards and that will allow me to put that curve on the front edge of the axe. And again I'm trying to take out any hammer marks that I might have left behind. And the final stage of this profiling is to actually profile the working edge of the axe. Uh, now in the drawing this has ever such a slight curve to it so I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to try and get an even thickness of edge as well. Um, I think I have a little bit too much material in this axe head so I'm not going to forge the edge right down to its beveled state uh, like the Anglo-Saxons possibly would have done and uh, that's purely because I don't want to make it too much longer than it would have been originally. And the final part of the profiling is, if you have a look at the drawing, you will see that uh, the taper of the axe head actually starts around the eye. Uh, so I am just drawing that taper back into the eye. Uh, so I've got the drift in there so that I'm not actually going to collapse the shape of the eye. It might stretch it out a little bit, but if you remember, I punched it smaller than it needed to be in the first place so that should compensate for this. And at this stage we pretty much have a pretty much finished axe head with regards to the forge work. Um, it does need some grinding uh, or filing or stoning or whatever you want to call it um, but that will have to wait till the next episode. So at this stage we are going to work on removing the swivel. Now I am going to use a very ancient and clever technique to remove this uh, which is commonly known in the UK as blunt force and ignorance. So I will get a heat in the handle, I will clamp the swivel 
and I will carefully rotate and pull. And what that will do is it will just open up the hole that holds the swivel and allow it to be extracted. Now you can see the upset on this picture here. So having done that, I then need, then need to close up that hole a little, so I will just forge down the outside again. Uh, and I'm actually quite happy to be doing this because uh, I did not like the swelling that was there. So it will actually take it down to a more realistic dimension. And then to close up that hole a little bit more, I will then using the ball peen, just hammer down on the face surrounding the hole uh, and that will close it up a little bit more for me. And here is the end result. So again I have a nice lip around there. So at this stage I'm going to work on actually fitting the handle. So in order to make it travel nicely through the eye of the axe head. Uh, I'm just going to bang a little shallow taper on there uh, which will allow it to actually get in the eye in the first place. So I'm dressing that so it doesn't gain any thickness or anything. And then with a good heat on the eye I will start putting that in there. Now if you're copying this uh, make sure that your handle faces the right way and start tapping it in. Now, when I conceived of doing this, when I conceived of doing it this way, I thought that I'd then remove the handle. Uh, however, having started, I realized that that would pretty much be uh, almost impossible. So I just went with it and hammered it in until it wouldn't go any further. Now, I think I mentioned that I wanted to heat up the handle and sort out those shoulders. Uh, as it turned out, the shoulders just formed their own passage around the eye uh, so they seated nicely. So with the handle inserted I then dressed the eyes a little bit, I then dressed the cheeks a little bit uh, to compensate for the flattening that will have occurred as I was driving in the handle. Uh, it didn't take very much work, they'd only shrunk by 2-3 mil. And here is the axe head fitting on the eye, and if I'm honest, it's a very good fit already. Uh, you barely need to rivet it on. However, the original was riveted, so I shall do the same. Uh, and to start with, I'm going to cut off the excess material on the tenon at the end of the handle. Uh, now this is an educated, arbitrary length, um, which is probably about 20 to 25 millimetres. And I just chiselled through most of that and then wiggled the stub off. Like so. And you can see that the eye is a little bit wider than the handle in this place. But that doesn't matter because we're going to be riveting it. So here it is cut off. Now this was an interesting discovery because I got a bit of heat in there. And I started riveting that. And if you observe the axe head, the inertia from me hammering on the handle is actually driving the axe head forwards. Uh, to start with, I just thought that I'd rivet it really quickly uh, before realising what had happened. So I did make a second attempt and the same thing happened. So at that stage, I actually went over to the vise and did it in there. Now, if you're thinking the Anglo-Saxons didn't have any vices, uh, you might be right, you might be wrong, I couldn't actually tell you. Uh, I certainly believe they would have had rudimentary wooden vices, uh, not with a screw like we have these days, but anyway, I digress. They could very well have just stood the axe up on the ground with uh, an apprentice holding it whilst a couple of blokes riveted the tenon down. Um, so the vice held it uh, and it reduced the inertia of the axe head uh, and allowed me to rivet it down. So again, I'm not 100% sure that this is what is present on the original, um, purely because I haven't been able to find any images uh, of the eye of the original, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but this is what I think is going on. So here we go, here it is riveted up. 
So at this stage it's quite solid. Now it's quite interesting to note here again that there is a bend just below the head of the axe on the original and I believe that this would have been from the riveting process uh, where if there was heat in the end of the handle uh, the whole thing would have bent backwards whilst it was being hammered. Uh, and at this stage I decided to normalise the blade. Now I don't want to normalise the whole thing because I don't want to loosen the rivet so I just sat it on top of the fire to normalise the carbon steel insert on the blade and on the hammerhead and once it had bypassed the curie point I set it to one side to air cool. So now we're going to replace that swivel. Uh, now I'm using a block of wrought iron which is probably just over an inch square and I am going to use the power hammer to first off forge a holding handle uh, on the end of the bar because I don't have any tongs of that particular size uh, those of you who watch my videos regularly know that occasionally I am prone to dropping my work from having the wrong sorts of tongs. Uh, so in this instance I just knocked down the end. Now there is a young gentleman called Jacob Edwards uh, who has been watching my videos. Now Jacob works for, or is on work experience with, I'm not sure, uh, Dave Preston who manufactured my power hammer. Uh, and if you want a power hammer like it, give Dave a call. Uh, you'll find him on Facebook under DP120. And Jacob spotted that my shims were not tightened properly on the power hammer. So Jacob snitched on me to Dave Preston, who then gave me a phone call and said, Rowan, consider yourself told off, tighten up the shims on your power hammer. Uh, and so I did. So well done Jacob Edwards for spotting that. Anyway, back to the task in hand, uh, I, I forged the square bar to 20mm round, uh, which is the size of the round section on the handle, uh, and then, like in the first video, I forged out a tenon, uh, which I forged to about 10mm square and then swaged it down to 6mm round, and this is what you end up with. So you can see it's a bit ugly on the end. Uh, not too bothered about that. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. So the next step was to retrieve my bolster plate and having cooled off the top of the bar I simply hammered down in order to square off the bottom. Now again bolster plates are reasonably common finds in um, early medieval blacksmith's toolkits. Uh, so this is probably the same way that the Anglo-Saxons would have done it. Uh, and you end up with a nice square base. Uh, you do end up with a bit of swelling so again I returned under my freshly maintained power hammer in order to reduce that diameter back down to 20 millimeters. Now if you're doing the same uh, I would possibly recommend getting this diameter to maybe 16 millimeters um, because it still ended up wider than it needed to be. So having dressed it under the power hammer I just returned with a short heat on the end just to re-square that bar. And at this stage here is where I am at. So I then cut off that bar uh, and I have more than enough material here. Now you can see a little bit of a split occurring but we will come to that in a minute. Uh, so at this stage I squared off the top end of the bar uh, and I gave myself less material for that collar than I did originally. Now you could very well have started with square bar and done a collar weld uh, which would have worked quite well. Uh, but I did it this way from a big piece of bar. So I drew this out to approximately 10mm 10 10 square, uh, which gives me this. So now because of the splitting that was occurring I then took a welding heat uh, and I actually used a little bit of flux for this which I don't normally do with wrought iron uh, and just welded up that delamination back together. And the reason I used flux was because I was worried about that tenon at the bottom so I didn't want to overheat it. So 
So having welded it back together, I then cut the cut both tenons down in size to make them a bit more easy to handle. And using uh, quite an old bolster plate, uh, which is actually a rivet heading tool, uh, I used my monkey tool and the rivet header to start squaring off either side of that collar. Bounces around a little bit, it's not ideal, uh, however it did do the job. So I used the monkey tool to start with and then forged out a little bit with the hammer. And after that was done I then rounded off uh, the material. So having rounded off the material, I then use a set hammer to just carefully even out the thickness of the material. And here we are at this stage. It's come out quite nicely if I say so myself. So now we need to start working on that eye. So for the eye I simply, as I did last time, went onto the power hammer and flattened out the material allowing it to spread out like so. And I then cut off the excess material which leaves me with this v-shaped section and this v-shaped section I then formed into a round section which is quite easy and quite satisfying I do like forming square to round And then I attempted to hot punch it. So this is standard punching, punch through one side. Shear the slug. And at that stage you could see the material actually splitting. So Blithely continued as before and used my bolster plate to drive out the slug, most of the way anyway. Uh, however, as you can see, it did split. Now, I did suspect that this would happen, uh, and it's not really that much of an issue. Uh, all I did was scarf both ends of the split, like so. just to get nice welding lines and then I brought them together uh, in a slightly out of focus kind of way, I do apologise for that uh, and then taking a short welding heat I just welded them back together And this is the end result. You can see the weld line, but it is solidly welded. So at that stage, I shortened the tenon, which will fit inside the handle. I got it to where I wanted it, and I gave myself a little bit more material this time round. Uh, because I think in the first episode I complained that I hadn't actually left myself enough material for a decent upset. Uh, and I reverse the way I did it as well. I stuck the swivel itself in the vise and brought the handle down on top of that. Uh, and I just simply tapped down on the riveted tenon from the handle in order to, in order to upset that material. And you know what? It worked. So then, with the dying heat of it, I Gave the swivel a few turns uh, just to loosen it up and make sure that it works correctly and it's not loose either which is quite nice 
Uh, you can see it's a bit oversized, but I'm not too bothered about that considering it looks a lot more like the original. So here is the assembled axe hammer. So it's fairly close to being done. Uh, I still need to put the bevels on the blade of the axe and clean up the hammer head. Uh, I also need to do a holding ring on the end of the swivel um, and of course I need to heat treat it. So that will all be for the next episode. I did attempt to film those parts uh, for this episode but my card ran out of space on the camera. So thanks for watching, a uh, massive thank you to my supporters on Patreon uh, and Big special shout out to Aaron Nelson as well, uh, who is one of my star Patreon donors. So thanks a lot, Aaron. And I will see you and the rest of you next week for the next episode. Bye.